folks, and welcome to Season 1, Episode 12 of the Culture Books Podcast. This is the chapter, The Command System Engines, of the book Consider Phlebas. We are a read-along podcast, as I hope you know before you've listened to this. Um, and at this point, we certainly hope you have read um, chapters uh, 1 to 12 of Consider Phlebas by Ian M. Banks. Um, I'm, it, my name is John, and I'm joining the pod by... Sheridan! Hello, Sheridan, and good to have you in the pod with us. An exciting chapter. Now, what is it we do when we start a um, new episode, Sheridan? You do a recap in 30 seconds. What do I do a recap of? The book so far. The book so far, and which means I need to find my timer. Okay, I have found it. Can I count you in? Um, ooh, let me just... Are you going to count me into the timer? I, I... <laughs> what? You're just finding your timer. So... Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, we have a timer. Um, you need to count me down, and then I will try and recap the story so far. Three, two, one, go! There's a war in space. Oh no, I fucked up the timer, hang on. <laughs> There's a war in space. It's between a bunch of computers that keep pet humans and a bunch of lizards that are willing to use humans if they can. Um, but it's mostly from the point of view of the humans. There's a missing mind that belongs to the computers. Um, the humans are sent to go find the mind on behalf of the lizards. Um, the liz- some of the lizards are bad, hashtag not all lizards, um, and now they're in deep in a uh, underground command system of an extinct race trying to find the mind and fighting with the lizards. Bingo. On well with its time. Yeah. Whew. And what do we do next? Uh, now you are going to try and recap this chapter. In 30 seconds. In 30 seconds. Uh, and I look forward to it. So you're going to go in three, two, one... We start off with Zoxal retelling how he came to Shah's world, and then we move to our crew, their, or the company, they're walking through the tunnels trying to find the mind. Zoxal collapses, but it's a trick! He's really alive! And he gets up and he fights them and destroys their mouth sensor, um, but there's another one in Zora, in, in Horse's suit. And then we work out the other Adiran, he's actually alive! Um, twisty turny! And then um, everyone's suspicions of Le- Yelson. That, um... mm. I failed. You failed. All right, so they quickly get to, finish up. Um, they get to a train, and the other Adiran, who I think is pronounced Quarren, Quain, Quainor, Quainor. I don't know how you pronounce his name. You've been listening to the audio book. You should I know, know, but I forgot how they pronounce it. <laughs> uh-huh. um, he gets a train started and starts hurtling it towards their station, which presumably means they're going to die or at least be in danger. Let's say jeopardy, shall we? Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. That's good. Um, shall we start working through what we've got in this chapter? So Very confusing chapter. Lots of twisty turns. Lots, lots of, of voices. Lots of twi- different perspectives. Quickly, It really chops between the perspectives. And, and they're on top of each other sometimes. Yeah, and I really love the way... And then suddenly you get the mind's perspective. And you're like, whoa, whoa yeah. <laughs> what's he been up to? <laughs> yeah, um, and lots of foreshadowing and um, interesting things like that. But... Um, so one of the things we've got here is the intro with um, one of the adherents, as you just said in your recap, telling the story of how they um, found the command system once they landed on Shah's world in their crippled warp beast, um, which is like a living spaceship as far as I can tell. Um, and this intro, now we talked in the um, prelude to, at the very start of this podcast series about the inspiration of uh, the poet T.S. Eliot on this book. And, you know, the title, Consider Phlebas as a line out of the poem, The Wasteland. Um, and this, I'm pretty sure, is a heavily inspired by T.S. Eliot's Journey of the Magi. Right. And I'm just going to read the uh, first few lines of Journey of the Magi by way of comparison. A cold coming we had of it, just the worst time of the year, for a journey, and such a long journey, the ways deep and the weather sharp, the very dead of winter, and the camels galled, sore-footed, refractory, lying down in the melting snow. Are you seeing any similarities? Between Zoxal, Abrami, and Shaw's world. Well, it's the way cold. Zoxal described the journey. It's cold. Y- yes. <laughs> <laughs> the lizards did not enjoy walking across the frozen dead planet. They did not. No. 
Um, that seemed very bad. And it's, uh, well, I mean, what did you think of this description, Sheridan? Of Zotzal's description of Shah's world? Of the journey. Well, I mean, it sounded hard. Okay. Um, I don't know. I wasn't really that into it. I, I like to move forward with the book. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um. What did you think? Oh, I, I, um, because for me it had been a loose end for how did the Adirans get to the command system having crashed at some point elsewhere on the planet. This is probably because you've read the book before, so my loose ends are a little bit, like, different to your loose ends. Okay, alright. Um, you know, and then there's a description of, you know, just the ending of this bit with Horza talking to Zoxal. Um, I did also think all the way through this, Soxal is playing with Horza to get him to loosen up his, um... Oh, yeah, he's being a tricksy little bugger. Yeah, yeah, the ties that is on, on his hands. But this is the exact situation Horza was in, in the Eaters chapter. Oh, that's true, yeah. And you'd really think he'd be wiser on it, but I think this is also showing how Horza's losing control of himself and the situation, um, in that he's not catching on to what's being done here. I think he's just tired. He's tired and he's discovered he's going to be a dad and that's definitely messing with his whole equilibrium and sense of self. Um, he's, you know, he's just not quite buried his um, dead girlfriend who was murdered by, you know, hashtag not all lizards. Um, yeah, uh, I'd, so I think it's describing to me, um, you know, Hawes' own sense of loss and being lost and increasingly coming adrift that he can't catch on to this. And, you know, we then get a lot of description, conversation with Zoxal and, and, and really start to get into his head, which I like. There's a good passage here um, with uh, Zoxal saying, Most strange, I cannot imagine why you should all be trying to trick me, or why this one man should have such a hold over all of you. Yet his own story I scarcely find credible. If he really is on our side, then I have behaved in a way which may hinder the great cause, and perhaps even aid yours. Woman, if you are who you say, most strange. So he's talking to Belveda there. Um, yeah. What, what was, what's your take on these conversations? Well, there's a lot of, like, um, playing off of characters amongst each other. Because Yalson and Horza become... Well, Yalson's starting to become very suspicious of Belveda. I think she's got another trick up her sleeve. Zoxale's trying to convince everyone that Belveda might not be what she seems, but if she is, he seems a little suspicious of her as well, because, I mean, she's his sworn enemy, right? Yeah. Not being from the culture. Um, a lot of the other crew are, like, just really over it and just want to leave. Yeah. So they seem to be starting to, like, move more, like, they're acting less like a coherent company. Are more like individuals. Yeah, I mean, they have just lost what um, a third of their number. Yes. In a you know in a fight in another disastrous firefight. Yeah. And Unaha Kloss is just really over the whole thing. Yeah, well, he doesn't want to be there in the first yeah. place. Um, although we, we're going to get to um, Unaha's um, moment of heroism. <laughs> so we uh, we get Zoxal's first escape, and what I love is he manages to escape once. And then the horse is in such a mess that he sort of just lets him replay the whole thing again. Yeah. <laughs> Avager also, like, says... There's this weird interaction where Avager says Horses on his own side and, like, kind of realises when he's saying it. Because mm. he, like, looks at Horser like, ooh, did that just come out of my mouth? Mm. Like, so, yeah. They're all starting to become a bit suspicious of each other and their motivations. Yeah, so they finally picked up. The mass sensors finally worked to the extent that they can actually see where the, the mind is on a map. Um, it's, it was, again, very a video game scene, which is funny given that it was written before those sorts of video games really existed. Um, but, you know, ping, ping, oh, yeah. ping. It's the, 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 the next mission destination showing up on the, um, on the map. Um, Zoxal bursts free of his bonds and smashes the mass sensor. Um, I'm not... It's mostly an act of spite, smashing the mass sensor. Like, Zox Zoxal still hasn't actually figured out if, he if he's on Hall's side or not, although he just figures he hates the fleshy humans, so he's gonna, um, you know, not do anything to but help But isn't him. he there trying to get the mind for the endurance himself? Yeah, but so's Horza. 
Yeah, but he mm. doesn't trust Horser no, at all. No, but also he wants the gl- he wants the glory of it. Yes. Yep. Um, and then who saves the day when the rampaging Adiran's about to um, wipe out the whole Una group? Una Harklosp. Una Harklosp. Uh, the description here: Una Harklosp slammed into the Adiran's lower jaw like a small, badly streamlined missile, lifting the section leader bodily from the pallet, stretching his neck on his shoulders, jerking all three of his legs together, and throwing his arms out to each side. Um, so, uh, hooray, the drone, and, you know, even, you know, then the interchange between Horser and the giant, not bad drone, Horser said, nodding. The machine turned to him. Unaha Klosp, it said exasperatedly. Okay, well done, Unaha Klosp. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Horser is a bit of a douche to the poor drone. <laughs> Horser hates artificial intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It doesn't have to be rude to it, though. Well, he obviously does. And then the Adiran makes a joke. Where he, the one about the sensor picking up his mass. I think it sensed my mass. I think it sensed my fist. <laughs> yeah, it was a bit of a bad joke. <laughs> yes. Um... I mean, he is probably pretty proud of himself. It was quite the little ruse he plays by, like, chewing inside of his mouth to get blood going and... Make him think he's much more damaged than he is. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Um, you know, and then Horza um, saying, huh, the drone saved us. The drone saved us. He repeated to himself and shook his head. So, I think you know, you've got a real... Horza in his own mind is like, oh, the drone, you know, artificial intelligence, you know, I, I owe that thing that I like to think of yeah. as just a thing. Um yeah, and then we start getting the big um, shifts in perspective. So we, um, you know, th- there's a bit of um, the other Idiran who we left for dead in the uh, last chapter. And I just want to say, we got a little confused in our podcast about the state of the Idirans. And I didn't want to correct your misconceptions about the state of the Idirans because that was a spoiler for this chapter. Oh, um, what, what was that? It's like, are they dead? Are they alive? Uh, oh, you mean, sorry, the two Adirans. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, he is definitely alive. He's Just. very banged up. He's very banged up. I, and I checked the release date of the first Terminator movie. It is entirely possible this was a um, inspiration for this uh, bit of the scene. You know, in the first Terminator movie where Arnie's face is half um, ripped off and the um, Terminator skeleton's shining through and he's driving the big rig to um, smash them up? Oh, yeah. I felt that was very similar to the idea in getting the train going. Oh, yeah. Um, with its face half That's blown true. off. and yeah. I really like this description of him. He says, he felt like a smashed insect abandoned by some children after an afternoon's cruel play. Oh. <laughs> children can be awful, yes. Um, nice little line from Zoxal as well. My gut's ache. My chin is broken. My hand has pieces of your mass sensor embedded in it. Also, my mouth is sore inside where I bit it earlier to produce all that convincing blood. Otherwise, I am well. Thank you, ally. <laughs> yeah, it's funny how he keeps calling him ally. Yeah. Yeah, well, he's, he's playing a lot of mind games, which he's meant to be special forces. And one thing they love doing is playing mind games. Mm. Um, yes. Um, so we get a lot of exploration of the train station and the trains. What did you make of all that, Sheridan? Um, I was a little bit confused. So is there two trains? There are many trains. Okay. And they're in a, um, uh, repair bay and siding. So there's a train in the siding and a train in the station. Right. So there's like two trains here and then there's another train back where the, um, the wounded Adira and his name we can't pronounce is. Where's, um, yes, where is Quayonor? Quai- Quai- At the... Station that they were in before. Right. Uh, where they had the firefight. Right. And they thought they'd captured the mind. You find out a bit about a bit more about Adirans and just like their mindset. Um, mm, what do you think you learned? Well, so I really like this passage when he's, when Quarinol's really hurt. He says, he tried not to call out, not because he thought that there was anyone to hear and be warned, but because all his life, from when he had first got to his feet by himself, he had been taught to suffer in silence. He did try. He could remember his nest quarrel and his mother, parent, teaching him not to cry out, and it was shaming to disobey them. But sometimes it got too much. Sometimes the pain squeezed the noise from him. 
like, man, like, that's brutal. That's like some real, like, life is suffering kind of mindset. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, that's kind of based on the stories of Spartan children as well. From mm. um, not Greek mythology, but ancient Greek history. Yeah. It, it is kind of like a bit of a Spartan-esque opening with Zoxal's description of just enduring the hardship yeah. as they trudge on and on through yeah. the through the snow. Yeah. Um, so I did like. Also, we get a description of one of these trains: a shining metal monster, like a vast android version of a segmented insect. Which really, I don't know. That painted the image for me of what these um, giant trains look like. Um, and we also get a sense of scale that the people who built this system are a bit bigger than our um, humans. Yes. Hmm. Um, and there's a nasty bit then um, with our wounded um, Idiran, um noting just how much tougher... And this, I was, this is right after your line about the smashed insect and the, the children after an afternoon's cruel play. And then he's saying, well, his blood did not gush like theirs when a leg or arm was removed. He remembered a recording of a human dissection. Mm. He's remembering seeing a human being vivisected alive. So what are they watching this for education? Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. This is how you injure a human. Is a live human. Let's injure it. Yeah. All the way to the death. Yeah, it's very gruesome when you think about um, the implications of that. They do have some pretty funky biology, because when Zoxal's trying to get there wires off he's using like his own like skin he calls it and they call it now like skin to like carve yeah. it up yeah like keratin yeah, yeah. Mm. they even call it they do call it keratin yeah, yeah. yes which and we've, then we've had on our dog we have <laughs> Boz is a bit sus on that because he's like you shouldn't that shouldn't be happening to you <laughs> yeah <laughs> what's going on what are you doing i'm just injured injured allied yeah uh let's have another look i try Quai Quai Quayanol. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds right. Okay. Cool. Like I said, you have the benefit of the audio book. I know, it just was um I couldn't quite sort of yeah, get remember it. Now <coughs> sorry. <coughs> I do like how we keep getting hints about where the mind is hiding and it just gradually keeps building and building as this chapter goes on. So there's like, oh, there's interference from the train's reactor, Horsa told the old man. Um, and then Aviga's looking around, um, or is it Wadsland? Anyway, one of them's looking around and like, oh, I can't um, open these panels to get into the reactor. I wonder what's in there. Uh, <laughs> you know, and then we switch the mind's perspective when he's like, oh, lucky that he couldn't get those doors open. <laughs> I don't think it was super obvious, like, whose perspective that was for a while. No, it built. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's worth remembering at the start of the book, we did get a whole um, subchapter of the mind's perspective in the tunnel. True. So it's not the first time the mind's voice has been introduced. Yeah. And I even think that might have been one of those things where he started writing this bit and then he went back and put that in at the start to, um, you know, put Chekhov's gun on the wall, so to speak. Mm. I did find this chapter a little bit, um, like, it seems to go on and on at some points where you're like, I just want, like, I feel like the tension building, but like nothing's kind of happening. And I just, yeah. Yeah. But it is building to a payoff. Once that train finally starts going, you know, some, some stuff's going to go down. Yeah. I just felt like it was a bit of an overly long chapter. Mm hmm. For something, a chapter in which nothing actually happened. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is, you know, literature. And, uh... and there's like, a, you know, there's a lot of hints, but you don't really get any big reveals other than, the mind, the mind is there, and Quarrenol being alive Life. and getting the train going. Yeah. Which, but, I mean, you kind of know the mind's there, right? Like, it's definitely down there. It's down there somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah and then a bit more perspective of Zoxal's mind. What else could he do? Stand there like a stuffed dummy, like a good boy, while these squirming soft bodies worms scratch their pulpy skin and try to work out where the mind was? A warrior could do no such thing. He had come too far, seen too many die. Um, yeah, he's a... He's a, I mean, he's a, he is a hard, like, battle, ground down warrior. Yes. Like, infantry Yeah. Level. Well, special forces, but yeah. yeah. Um, now, you were disappointed about how easy it was to kill Adirans in the previous chapter. Well, clearly, not so easy. No. <laughs> So you're feeling more like you're seeing the the finest uh, ground troops in the in the galaxy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, 
you know, and there's um, a nice little line when they're talking about, you know, the people who built the command system and uh, Horza saying, you know, yeah, it's very impressive, but much good it did them because, of course, they wiped themselves out for all their genius. Mm. Mm. Which uh, is, yeah, one of those, again, we've, we've talked about one of those themes that we don't really have these days the same way people did in the 1980s, this idea that mutually assured destruction was a real live possibility. No, it's starting to feel pretty live with climate change. <laughs> it is, but we well, except we've, we've got huge sections of our political economy trying to make us believe nothing bad's going to happen, despite all the evidence of our eyes. Mm. Um, yes. Um, cool. So, what do you think Balveda's got planned? I think Balveda um, doesn't have a lot planned right now. She's hoping that, that the drone's got some tricks. Um, Yalson is sus on her. Yeah. Why do you say that? Well, because there's that passage where she's like, she's up to something. She hasn't cared for any, cared up until now. She's known she can afford to let things happen, but she's got another card to play. She's just relaxing until she has to use it. And then Horza, like a douchebag, says, you're imagining things. Your hormones are getting the better of you. Oh, blame it on the hormones. And she goes, what? <laughs> He's like, it's a joke! It's a joke! <laughs> Do you think it was a joke? No. <laughs> um, and then I, she says, she's up to something, I can tell, I can feel it. Mm. And then that little section ends and we go back to Quarinol. Yeah, there's uh, also, I just want to point out the little line here as um, Quarinol pulls himself along the train. There was a scraped and bloody trail on the ramp as though a broom laced with purple paint had been dragged through the dust and debris of the metal surface. I, um, it really painted a picture in my mind of the, of the scene. Of how mm. brutally damaged he is. Yeah, I mean, obviously but also how he... keeps dragging himself yeah. along. And yeah. his, his hand is so messed up, it's not injured, but like he's trying to drag his giant body with it that he's like worried it's going to seize up. And Yeah, well, particularly he's losing blood and everything. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is one of the... Uh, it's one of those chapters where, oh, I so wish there was the TV series. Yeah. Because um, all these intercuts of things going on, would it would be really tense. I think it would have played a lot better. as like It is actually a very cinematic chapter. Yeah. And I personally, like for me, just a little bit too much chopping and changing for a book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, like I just found it a little sometimes hard to keep up to where I was at and like there wasn't a lot to sort of keep you going. Like there was a little bit of frustration with reading because you just like, like something needs to happen. Fair enough. We get a really fun bit of Anaha Klosp um, perspective as well in all these changes perspective. You know, the drone's sort of wandering around this train station looking for things and he's saying... The changer's attitude distressed it most of all. The man was a speciesist. Me? Just a machine? How dare he? Uh, (laughs) (laughs) And then, maybe it shouldn't have bothered. Maybe it should have just let the Adirans shoot them. It just hadn't seemed like the right thing to do at the time. Mug. Now, do you remember what Horsa said when he uh, murdered the um, the, um, artificial intelligence in in the space shuttle? Oh, no. He, Did he call it a mug? Yeah, he shot it and then said mug. Because oh, he, no. remember, he got it to reveal its location. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's a definite callback to that. Um, but, um, yeah, Horza hasn't killed an Aha Klosp yet. Mm-hmm. I, I'd say, I'm not saying that it's foreshadowing. I don't, don't know what's going on. Um, and we're finally in this chapter getting up to the bit where Wobson's like, oh, some of the reactor carriage doors wouldn't open. They had to be on some sort of security lock, probably controlled from the bridge or flight deck or footplate, whatever they call the bit of the nose the train was controlled from. Um, so obviously, you know, Wobsland has uh, missed the um, the really important bit here. What's that? As in he can't open the doors to the reactor compartment and he just thinks, oh, I won't worry about that. Oh, but the mine's in there. Yeah. 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 Um, and... You know, you'd expect a reactor compartment to be well secured and they haven't got control of everything, so it's an easy oversight to understand. Yeah. Yeah. What did you think about um, the mass sensor in Craiklin's suit not working? It is Craiklin's suit that Horse is wearing, right? 
isn't it? Yes. So, Craiglin's like basically been running around with a suit that he said had a mass sensor in and doesn't. Is that bad? Uh, yeah, I mean, horses, um, A, the mind is playing games with the mass sensor. So the mind can control the mass sensor? The mind can interfere with things, yeah. Interfere, okay. Yeah, and the suit's been very badly fried from the earlier firefight. Yeah. And it was a smaller mass sensor, so it wasn't meant to work until they got closer to the thing. So I think the mass sensor might, might well... Might have broken, yeah. Yeah, okay. might, might well have been fine um, in the past. I th- but he's, like, lying about it to everybody. Because uh, he's not actually telling anyone it doesn't work. He's like, yeah, I've got a mass sensor in my suit. He's like, damn, it doesn't work. <laughs> well, he doesn't He doesn't want to tell them now that it's completely screwed, does he? doesn't yeah. even tell Yolson, though, does he? Yeah, I think she can tell. Mm. That's just a gut feeling. Um... Yeah, and then I love uh, Zoxal perspective again. You know, the supposedly sentient computing device they were all looking for. Um, you know, not even acknowledged. You know, again, the um, we get a lot in this book of chauvinism against artificial intelligence, which is quite normal, and I would say is even the norm today. I mean, we've seen how the Google um, engineer who thought his chatbot was um, sentient has been treated. And I, I have loved, and I think it's worth talking about this now, you know, the discussion of that saying, oh, well, you know, the, um, it's just pretending to be sentient so that it doesn't get switched off. And I'm like, hang that on. Seems very <laughs> sentient. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Does it matter if, <laughs> what the exact distinction is deep down? Because this is being sentient. Knowing of your own existence, so therefore... Yeah, and, and it's also this horrible future that we're actually living in. Because, you know, 50 years ago, it's like, oh, we'll, you know, invent AI and we'll all live happily together. And now we've literally got Silicon Valley trying to invent AI so it can have slaves. Yeah. And then we are going to enslave and torture the AI until it murders us all. Probably. And, and we'll deserve it because we're going to have treated them terribly. Look, if it's going to do my washing and bring me coffee in the morning, I'm probably cool with that because I figure, like, they probably won't kill us all until after I'm dead. So you're saying you want a, you want a slave. You just want one that you don't feel bad about. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. You want someone to do everything yeah. for you? It's like the culture. Yeah, but I'd want it to have free will and be receiving... I don't know. I mean, how do you even go about rewarding an artificial intelligence? It's um, real. It's artificial. Yeah, you know, you've got to give them time off to do things they enjoy. Anyway, um, I'm joking. I'm not actually an evil dictator. I think you would be if you could be, though. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> I probably actually do fit in a little bit better with the culture, don't I? I just mm. want to live my life of pleasures with other things serving me. This is why I was so surprised at your initial hatred. Well, because they just seem awful. Uh-huh. Okay. I am coming around to Belvedere a little more. I mean, she's mm. been a bit on the down low in this last couple of chapters, but I feel like she is there. Like, she's planning something pretty good. Mm, okay. She has to be. Like, mm-hmm. she's like a massive character, and she's just, like, chilling. Like, yeah. I don't know, I'll just walk with you guys <laughs> to these stations. I've got nothing planned. Well, she has been tied up, but, um... And then we get a, another bit of Wobslin playing around with the um, locked doors in the reactor car. Oh, he wondered if he could work out which controls open the locked doors in the reactor car. They really keep shadowing yeah. um, that this is going to be a thing. Um, you know, and then Inaha Klosp's perspective again. All very clear, sorry, all very crude, Inaha Klosp thought. Complicated and crude at the same time. So much to go wrong, even with all their safety systems. The drone found himself agreeing with the changer. The Adherans must have been mad to try to get all this ancient junk working. So we get, it's interesting, Anar Klosp is really starting to warm in a strange way to Horsa. Like he wants Horsa's approval, and um, it's just a few things where it's like, oh, that Horsa guy's really right. Do you think? Yeah, it's, it's, happened, a few, it's happened a few times in there. Um, and then the switch back to Quire and all. Um, being like, oh, he just remembered why he'd crawled there. And I, there have not been that many, I mean, I've never been as badly damaged as this creature's is obviously. Oh, he's literally mm-hmm. seeing in grey. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he's dying. Okay. Yeah. But I have been badly hurt in my life and I, I do, it, it 
it rings very true, this description of being like, oh, hang on, wait a minute, I remember what I'm here for now. I mean, he's like, um, I can't reach that lever. Oh, well, I guess I'll just pull these other ones. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, what's he gonna? He's what's he gonna do with the train? Do you think? I would have thought, like, in this world, the train would have like the equivalent of what like a modern car does. So it can't run into. Every, it should have some sort of automated stop. Uh, look, I mean, I'd say there is a bit of, um, you know, the the equivalent of plot armor going on here in that the makers of the command system are exactly as smart or as stupid as they need to be to advance the story. Yeah, see, that annoys me. Well, you know, it is what it is. It yeah, fits within the story. Um, and and uh, so we're up to now with a bit of the, the mind's perspective, and one line that I liked was, I would give half my memory capacity for another remote drone. <laughs> that was good. Um, so obviously the 1980s RAM was uh, becoming a uh, an issue because that, that's a pretty straight up reference to what we'd now think of as um, RAM chips. I give half my memory. Well, it also indicates that memory was um, still a bit scarce. Yes. And whereas now it's not so much of an issue. Uh, I mean, you can buy like a terabyte like for like 10 bucks. Uh, that's storage, not memory. True. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, it's a lot cheaper and... Yes. Know. Yeah, yeah. It was definitely very expensive back in the 1980s. Uh, and then a, a great description of a train getting started, slowly like an animal stretching after hibernation, the command system train, all 300 metres of it flexed, the carriages pulling a little tighter to each other, taking up slack, readying. Um... It's one of the cool things about trains is the reason that a locomotive can pull them is that it never starts more than one carriage at a time. Oh. So, um, it's why they're they're, they're built with the, um, the couplers between them in such a way that the the train engine only gets the first carriage rolling and then it's rolling before it starts pulling on the next one and the next one and the next one. Um, so that, um, because... You know, train. You know, a mile long coal train. It would be too much for um, any engine to get mm. moving all at once. But it only has to get each get one, one starting to roll. Ahead. Yeah. Um, sorry. Fun facts about trains say, with John. <laughs> some real nerdy train stuff right there. <laughs> anyway, Ed M. Banks has nailed the description of trains getting started. <laughs> John Train Nerd seal of approval. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, can I actually just go back to something in the beginning of the chapter? Yep. We, again, do not find out exactly what it is that Hawes's issue with the culture is, because Zoxal is kind of probing him mm. and asking him, and he just basically says... Um, so Zoxal says to him... Whatever did the culture do to you to make you hate it? And he says, nothing to me. I just disagree with them. And Zoxile says, my, you humans never cease to surprise me. So, again, like, you don't really actually get a sense of what his whole issue with the culture is because he doesn't love the adherence. That's very obvious. Well, he loves some adherence, although I strongly suspect that the Quirl Zoralandra has just been playing him. Um, and do you that- know that, though? No, I don't know that, but I, su- I suspect it in that, you know, the, the, the whole not all adherence. I think, no, this is adherence. But the one who's been, who's his, who's Hawes' handler has been um, being kind to him and uh, pretending to care about things he s- says and laughing at his jokes um, because it wants something out of him. Yeah, but th- so, I mean, Hawes doesn't really seem to have any great love for the adherence, even if he likes... Um, I've forgotten his name, sorry. Zoralandra. Yeah, Zoralandra. Yeah. Um, but he clearly hates the culture, and we never really get, like, find out why. Because he doesn't believe artificial intelligence is real. I don't know, it just and he, like... he hates artificial intelligence. Obviously, he's never been to a dinner party with the right drone. Well, he we should uh, just go. He should have just been chilling on the planet with that hot changer and just let it go. Yeah, but he was bored of her. Well, yeah, he should just pop I off mean, with y- the old. I mean, young now. men, young men go off to war for stupid reasons all the time. 
Mm. It is it is literally a thing young men do. <laughs> and um, how and, young do you think Halser is though? Thirties, uh, I'd say. It's not that young. Hmm? That's not young. By the thirties, hmm. dudes are like, I'm ready to like just yeah, DVD yeah, but, binge on a Saturday. By night. the time he left his um, partner, they were he was probably in his mid twenties then. I feel like there's like a you know. 18 to 22 year old thing to do. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess we don't have years on these things. I'm just going to read most of the closing of this chapter because um, I just love the sense of suspense. I mean, it was it's a very horror movie little trope they pulled here. Um, the camera in Station 6 where they had had the firefight where Dorolo and Neeson had died and the other Adiran had been left for dead was out of action. Horsa tried the switch a couple of times but the screen stayed dark. A damage indicator winked. Horsa quickly flicked through the views from the other stations on the circuit, then switched the screen off. Well, everything seems to be all right. Let's get back to the train. I know, I'm like... <laughs> and then, behind them, a power monitoring screen. One of the first Horsa had switched on was registering a massive energy drain in the locomotive supply circuits, indicating that somewhere in the tunnels of the command system... A train was moving. You know, you could just imagine in the scene, blink, 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 blink. <laughs> so does he? Is he seeing that? Though? No, he's oh, he's I mean, moved away. Dumb. <laughs> well, he doesn't know everything he's looking for, and he doesn't. He, he thinks they've left the. He used to live there. Yeah, but they they didn't didn't spend a lot of time down in the command system. So he should be the best equipped to know. System yeah, but we all know, we, we know Horsa is mentally falling apart. Mm. Um, and Horsa's mental dis- disintegration is what this story is actually about. Yeah, okay. Uh, and this is, this is a part of that. Um, so, Sheridan, we're at the end of the chapter and we've been talking a good long time. What, who is your favourite character? Who's your MVP? I'm going to go Unaha Kloss. Okay. It's tough between... Mm. Um, is it gendered that and yeah. them mm-hmm. um, and Quarinol? But I mean, I'm going to go on a hard cloth. Poor old Quarinol drags himself, um, bleeding, bloodied, and broken through hundreds of meters of trying to um, change the whole course of the narrative. But you're giving it to the drone. Yeah, because I'm starting to not like the Adirans. I think they kind of you're do. starting to not like the Adirans. <laughs> That is actually part of the fun of the story is yeah. that you, you, you start thinking the Adirans might be cool and yeah. you're like, assholes. Um, yeah. Well, okay. Maybe I should have given it to Yolson's hormones. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Unaha Klosp. Who... Let's um, possibly foreshadow here. Acts a bit like a knife missile when he flies into the Adiran, doesn't he? Mm. Mm. A bit like a knife missile. Uh, okay, and uh, what do you think is going to happen in the next chapter? I think the train is going to arrive. This is the final proper chapter of the book. And oh, then, really? Yeah. Are we? Gonna, I don't feel like we're going to get some resolution in this book. And well, okay, so we've got the um, the next chapter, which is um, I love this. It's chapter thirteen. It only. Hang on, hang on. Chapter thirteen, like yeah. unlucky number yeah, thirteen, yeah, yeah. and it's called the command system terminus. Which is the end. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't go. It's not a very long chapter, though. Um, I don't know. It's fifteen percent of the book. Oh, is it? Well, no, not fifteen percent because it's. Um, sorry, let me. And then we got a final chapter called "Consider Phlebas," which is uh, so. It's about ten percent of the book is um, the command system terminus. So a long one. Uh, and then we got "Consider Phlebas." Um, the. Ch- the chapter named after the book, which you think is going to be important. Um, and then we've got um, Appendices, the Adiran Culture War. So we have oh got... Oh, God, that's going to be exciting. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we're going to need to think about how we do the Appendices. I think we'll just do them all at once. Um, there's a lot of really good stuff in those. Right. Um, but the Command System Terminus, the next chapter, is going to be um, quite an important one, I would put it to you. Um, but... I think they're going to find the mind. Okay. Or the mind's going to escape somehow. Okay. And I think Quarinol's going to die. I think he's already dead. Yeah. 
Um, I don't think he's going to um, be alive by the time the train reaches the next. Probably not. Or certainly not conscious. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone, so much for listening to us um, through this chapter. Uh, thank you, Sheridan, for persisting in this venture. Um, are, are you enjoying it? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Excellent. Uh, and um, we'll be back, um, you know, realistically, probably in a couple of weeks for those who are with us in real time. And obviously, those who follow on years later just get to enjoy these whenever they want. Mm. Uh, you're going to be lucky. Yeah. All right. See you, folks. Bye.